Mommy? Yes, dear. When's Daddy gonna be here? Daddy will be here soon, dear. He'll be here soon. I won't see him yet. When's he gonna be here? He'll be here soon. When's he gonna be here? Dear, I'm really angry with your dad. He said he'd be here by 3 o'clock to pick you up, and once again, he's showing us that he really doesn't care about your feelings. He's acting as though he just doesn't love you. Look, you know how much I'm looking forward to seeing Michael today. All right then, Jerry. Meet us at 3 p.m. at Brent Kyobin Field. And this time, don't be late. Brent Kyobin Field, 3 p.m.? Don't worry, I'll be there. Bye-bye. Hello, my name is Theo Bauer. I'm the executive director of the Nanaimo Men's Resource Center. The scene that you just witnessed is an example of a behavior called parental alienation. Parental alienation occurs when one parent, knowingly or unknowingly, turns their children against the other parent. And I'm Carmen Barkley, child care consultant and owner of a go-between service providing supervised access. Parental alienation is generally in response to separation or divorce. What happens is a child will align themselves with one parent and become preoccupied with unjust or exaggerated denigration of the other parent. Theo and I decided to make this video so that we could raise public awareness and educate people about parental alienation. But we would like to be clear from the outset that parental alienation is not officially recognized as a syndrome by either the Canadian Psychological Association or the American Psychological Association. However, these bodies do recognize parental alienation as a behavior which occurs in a variety of circumstances particularly in the process of separation and divorce. In North America today, with the divorce rate being what it is, approximately one out of two marriages ending in divorce, this causes an extreme amount of stress within families. And typically, children do better when they stay connected to both parents. But for a variety of reasons, including unresolved feelings and legal positioning, parents do put their children in the middle by engaging in parental alienation. Both mothers and fathers can be guilty of participating in parental alienation. Studies have shown that this type of behavior causes difficulties for children. Children who have been alienated are more likely to drop out of school, get involved with drugs, or other illegal activities. In this video, we will explore parental alienation through interviews with parents, through a discussion with a psychologist, and through dramatic sequences which will help to illustrate this behavior. We will also show how parental alienation can be recognized, how outside influences play a role, and what we can do to help prevent it. First, we thought we'd talk to a psychologist who has over 20 years of experience doing assessments and reports related to family issues. Dr. Larry Waterman will explain the components of parental alienation from a clinical perspective. In its extreme form, parental alienation happens when one parent, out of frustration, bitterness, hurt or anger, consciously or unconsciously aligns the children to his or her side. Then, after brainwashing the children, the same parent campaigns with the children to destroy their relationship with the other parent. There are eight parental alienation components which may or may not be present in every situation. The first component is the most basic. The child is aligned with the alienating parent in a campaign of denigration and hatred against the target parent, with the child making active contributions. When it first starts, parental alienation is very hard to identify. When marriages first break up, 
There are all kinds of stresses which often bring out some very angry or unusual behavior on the part of the parents. This is to be expected. But if these destructive activities continue, we start to see behaviors that are more typical of parental alienation. As the years go by, the child becomes more and more distant and withdrawn from one parent, having sided with the alienating parent because of the ongoing campaign of continuing hatred and denigration toward the target parent. Healthier parents are able to keep the needs of the children foremost in spite of their divorce process. So Larry, tell me, how would you be able to tell if a child was participating in this campaign of denigration? Well, the child could participate in the alienation by asking the custodial parent to tell the target parent that they don't want to see them on a weekend on which they're scheduled to see that particular parent. It must be absolutely devastating for the parent that's being targeted. Yes, it can be very upsetting and it's also very unjust, especially when there's no justification for the child's decision. The second component of parental alienation can be identified when rationalizations for depreciating the target parent are weak, frivolous, or absurd. For example, a child may complain that the bad parent wanted me to take out the garbage or took me to Disneyland when I didn't want to go. The child may be unable to provide good reasons for this stance or may provide reasons that they can't explain or even understand when asked. At the Men's Centre in Nanaimo, I've heard so many parents complain about the absurd reasons why their kids don't want to spend time with them. The level of hostility seems totally incompatible with the kinds of accusations being made. I imagine it can be very hurtful and confusing for the targeted parent. You're absolutely right. When I'm interviewing a child, they'll often tell me that they hate the targeted parent. Then we sit and watch a video of them playing and hugging and kissing that same parent. But they deny that they're really having fun. It can be quite ridiculous when the evidence is so clearly contradictory to what the child's behavior is demonstrating. The third component of parental alienation can be recognized when animosity from both the alienating parent and the child toward the targeted parent lacks the ambivalence that is normal in human relationships. Often, children will not recognize any positive aspects in the target parent or any negative aspects in the loved parent. There seems to be nothing at all that they like about one parent and they totally reject them. This is not a natural reaction unless there's been proven abuse or neglect of the child by the target parent. These extreme reactions that we're talking about happen when there has been no abuse or neglect. It's typical for most children that there will be things that they like and dislike about each parent. It sounds as in this situation it's very black and white for them, like when they say that they love one parent and hate the other. Yes, it's almost like amnesia, where the child's good memories with the alienated parent appear to be completely destroyed, and less positive memories are exaggerated or distorted to be much worse than they were originally. Now with the fourth component of parental alienation, the child states that the decision to reject the tar targeted parent is their own. The custodial parent will sometimes testify in court that they want the child to visit the targeted parent, but the child doesn't want to. A judge wouldn't usually accept that a child doesn't have to attend school because they don't want to, so why would the court accept that a child not visit the targeted parent for the same reason? In fact, it's a red flag for me if the alienating parent says that it's not fair to make a child do something like visit the targeted parent if the child doesn't want to. I don't think children are born with genes that program them to reject a father or mother. Larry, would you agree that the child is being so strongly influenced by the alienating parent in these situations that they don't want to visit them because they're afraid of going against that parent's wishes? Yes, that can certainly be the case. Let's face it, children are smart. They learn very quickly who has the power over their lives and who can inflict pain and suffering if they don't meet the expectations of the alienating parent. As we are seeing, such situations can get very complex. When the fifth component is present, there's almost an automatic reflexive support by the child for the parent with whom they have sided. For example, when I ask a child why they hate the targeted parent, or why they don't want to visit them, they will often say that they don't know. It must be very confusing to kids who are caught in the middle. After all, these kids are just trying to please an alienating parent who says they are there to protect them. You're right, it is. Remember, the child is aligned with the alienating parent, who is usually the custodial parent. 
For obvious reasons, that parent has the most power over the children. Sometimes the best thing to do is conduct a full custody assessment to really find out what's going on. Families are very complex structures and it takes a lot of investigation to really understand what's happening in these situations. The sixth component is when the child expresses a guiltless disregard for the feelings of the alienated parent. One parent is seen as being perfect and can do no wrong, but the other can do no right. The child doesn't seem to care if the targeted parent's feelings are hurt. There is little or no gratitude for any gifts or support or the other nice things that parent might have done. The child may even state that the alienated parent doesn't deserve to see them. Again. When asked, the child will be unable to provide any good reasons for such a statement. It amazes me that children can be programmed to respond with such cruel disregard and be oblivious to the effect that this can have on one of their parents. The seventh component of parental alienation is the presence of borrowed scenarios. This means that the children's responses have a rehearsed or coached quality, often reflecting expressions and actual words used by the alienating parent. It's important to remember that children's cognitive development happens in stages. For example, an eight-year-old child does not have the cognitive ability of an adult. When asked about their reasons, the child may make up a silly explanation or even admit that they don't understand what they're saying. Yes, from my experience, children are great imitators and mimics. They will take on the beliefs and attitudes of their parents and make them their own. You're right. We often hear a six-year-old child making statements that a 16 or 20-year-old would make, statements that are far ahead of their normal level of conceptual and cognitive development. For example, they might say, Daddy's new girlfriend is a real slut. But if you ask them where they heard that or what that means, they won't be able to tell you. The eighth component of parental alienation is found when we see an obvious spread of the child's animosity extend out to include the targeted parent's extended family. Grandparents, aunts, uncles and cousins are all tarred with the same brush. So the relationship with the child becomes lost to all of these relatives as well. These are the eight components of parental alienation. If a few of these components are present, it may indicate mild alienation. If three to five components are present, it may indicate moderate alienation. And if six to eight components are present, it probably indicates extreme alienation. Parental alienation was first identified by Dr. Richard Gardner in the mid-1980s. He identified parental alienation in three distinct levels, mild, moderate, and extreme. Since that time, much controversy has raged about whether parental alienation is actually a syndrome. Whether it's identified as a syndrome or not, parental alienation is still an important problem that needs to be addressed by the court system and by society at large. Psychologist Dr. Douglas Darnell identified three distinct types of alienators, naive, active, and obsessed. The following scene illustrates an example of a naive alienator. Don't answer the phone. Please leave a message. Hi, Jory. Hi, Tom. This is Mum. I just wanted to talk to you for a minute. I'm looking for. Remember, kids, I told you not to answer the phone when Mummy calls. It's not a good time. We can call her later when we're not busy. But, Dad, we haven't talked to Mum all week. I want to talk to her. Yeah, Dad, we want to talk to her. No, guys. Give me a call as soon as you can. I love you both, you know. I miss you. Give me a call. By the way, Jory, I'm not happy about what your mother said to you in that letter about what's happening at school. The previous scene is a good example of a naive form of alienating. Parents should not limit access between the child and the other parent. Most divorced parents do participate in some sort of naive form of alienation. However, they recognize the importance of the child spending time with the other parent. And children will come to accept that their parents disagree or argue at times. The next scene is another form of parental alienation. It's the act of alienator. Hey, Mom. Hey, Mom. Hi, guys. Hi. 
Thanks for the weekend. It's been a lot of fun and we'll see you guys again soon. Take it easy. By the way, when are you planning on giving me the rest of the money you owe this month? What do you mean? I've been telling you for months you should be paying for that kind of stuff out of your government child supplement. Now, stop bugging me in front of the kids like this. You know we should be talking about this kind of thing in private. I have every right to ask you about this. You are not being fair. You should be thinking about your kids' needs. I'm getting sick of your selfishness. And you can tell your mom that she can't take the kids out for lunch My this mother. week. We're just too busy. Nice. Mom, Dad, quit arguing. You're always fighting. I hate it. Now look what you've done. Give me a break. Can't you see I'm bending over backwards to be a good dad? I'm leaving. This is ridiculous. Go! That's just what I've been telling you about your dad. He just can't control his anger. I'm really getting sick of his outbursts. In reaction to personal hurt or bitterness, the parent who is an active alienator will often lash out against the other parent in front of the children. After calming down, they may realize that they were wrong and try to repair the damage. Nevertheless, these parents continue to be passively rigid and uncooperative with the other parent. In the next scene, we look at a more extreme example of parental alienation, the obsessed alienator. Mom, how come you're always mad at Dad all the time? I'm just so tired of your dad's annoying new girlfriend. I'm sure she's trying to turn your dad against all of us. I bet she's taking all of Dad's money. And your dad's trying to control our lives all the time. I know what's best for me and my kids. I just wish he'd move to Timbuktu. Then we wouldn't have to put up with all of his power tripping. The horrible things that your dad does to you and me all the time to make our lives miserable just keeps me thinking that he never did love me and he never really loved his kids. Sometimes I wonder if he even really wanted to have kids. Mom, do we have to visit dad this Christmas? I really don't want to. The obsessed alienator is a parent with a cause to align the child to his or her side and campaign against the targeted parent to destroy whatever relationship may be left. Many children are now growing up without their dads. Most alienated parents are fathers due to the courts awarding custody to mothers about nine to one. Unfortunately, because of parental alienation and other factors, we are creating a fatherless society. And the repercussions of this are just starting to impact our communities. Studies have shown that there are many negative consequences to lone parenting. The majority of lone parents are moms, and a high percentage of these moms are poor and suffer from a variety of health issues, such as more stress and higher substance abuse. The children tend to have more problems too, in the area of health, more challenges in school, and more issues around social adjustment. And of course, fathers suffer too. They experience more stress and health issues, have more problems with drugs and alcohol, depression and suicide. Their teenage and young adult children tend to leave school early, engage in risky sexual activity and drug use, experience more unemployment, and participate in more criminal activity. And these children tend to have higher divorce rates following in the footsteps of their parents. Alienated parents can tell us much through their own personal stories and challenges. Our first father tells us of his worries. Well, I guess for myself, uh, as we talked earlier, I, I reached out and I've established a support system myself. And I've, it's incredible how I've come a long ways. I really have, I was able to let go of a lot of anger, even a lot of resentment, you know, the, because that's where you tend to want to go as a human being. Mm -hmm. But because of my established support system, I, I, I feel for I was able to let most of that go. Uh, f but for our daughters, I have to be honest, I worry. I truly worry about them. So I have to be honest, I, I don't know what are the consequences. But I know they will be. Because, you know, people react differently. Some people turn to drugs, some turn to sex, some t turn to whatever other, you know, uh, self-destructive behavior. Yeah. I know there will, you know, there will be some. I'm, I'm hoping as a parent that I will be able to be there 
and then support them and always listening to what's going on and and be open enough to see you know I'm hoping but mm -hmm. however that's going to turn I don't know to you but I am afraid for them for their health our second father speaks of his frustrations in dealing with the court system and I don't know what got said or or what happened after that and then all of a sudden the access is just stopped completely and she that's when she did the custody access evaluation and all this other stuff and and just said I'm not gonna let her come and just put her in the court order was there and she just denied disobeyed it and I went back to court about three times for that and then I then maintenance enforcement was starting to step on me pretty heavily then too so I was I was fighting with her for the access and then I was fighting with them because I had a trust fund for my daughter that I set up instead of, I said fine if if she's not gonna let me see her and I no one's gonna stand up for my court order I'm gonna I'm not gonna obey my the other end of the court order and then mm -hmm. you know that got me into a lot of trouble staking that stand another parent had success in the courts but still experienced ongoing difficulties I knew within 14 days that my ex just cut off access and that I needed to seek legal action right away. I, it just was so apparent. Um, there was no give with, um, with my ex. Um, so I went straight into Supreme Court um, and started the process um, that lasted a year and three quarters. But um, there really was uh, was no one thing. She was just stopped access. And that was it. She just said, you can't see your children. You can't it, see your child. Exactly. Exactly. Just like that. You know, I had no choice at all. So I knew to go right to court. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and it did very little good. I mean, I got free and generous access, but it meant nothing. It really meant nothing. Most often, it's the non-custodial parent who is the alienated parent. Consequently, fathers are the ones most frequently affected. However, mothers can also be the target parent. In the following interview, a mother describes some of her experiences and feelings of loss. I have a child that I haven't seen for half of his life. Mm. You know, he, I don't know him. I don't know what he likes. I don't know what he does. Mm -hmm. It is. It's like death. Yeah, but worse. I was just driving myself crazy trying right. to fix it. Yeah. And I just couldn't accept that it wasn't in my control. <laughs> you know, and, mm -hmm. and once I did that, at least I was able to have some peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, peace, I guess you would call it. I, you know, and, and I can at least think that I didn't do anything to harm them. You yeah. know, I didn't purposely harm them. And, and I, I'm, I'm, I was going to say it's harder as a woman. I'm sure it's not harder as a woman, but it's less common as a woman. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. other mothers tend to be very... I, I don't often talk about it. Mm -hmm. I, don't of, I don't talk about it with anybody except for my closest friends. And, and family because of that very reason people don't understand it's not a situation that's well understood mm -hmm. and it's not something that has been formalized in society in it's grieving mm -hmm. but it is not a formalized sort of grieving mm -hmm. there aren't any sympathy cards there aren't mm -hmm. any nobody brings you a casserole you know and says yeah. you know um, it, it's just, you're basically, you're alone, you feel alienated. Mm -hmm. So I, I haven't talked about it much. Right. Mm. Yeah. There are many contributing elements to the situation when parental alienation occurs. The court system, counselors, psychologists, teachers, administrators, and of course the extended family and friends. The courts have a mandate to deal with the problem 
but the courts are based on an adversarial criminal justice system that isn't well suited to family issues. In many ways, the courts actually criminalize parents who are separating and divorcing. The courts are slowly starting to recognize parental alienation. However, consequences of any usually come too late for the children. Once the alienation becomes entrenched, it's extremely difficult to create change. Even though the court system can be very expensive and is far from perfect, in an alienating situation, the courts may act as a last resort in resolving the situation. That's if a judge is willing to make the difficult decision to change custody. When alienation becomes entrenched, there are few other options but to remove the children from the alienating parent. It is wonderful when mediation or counseling works, but with moderate to extreme alienation, it's usually too late for either option. Counselors and psychologists are becoming more aware of the components of parental alienation. Teachers and school counselors can be sympathetic and useful, but many of the school boards have policies in place that don't allow them to get involved. Extended family and friends can be helpful too, but they can also be guilty of creating more alienation. We have looked at many of the problems that occur when parental alienation happens. What are some of the solutions? Frequently, the only solution is to go back to court and ask for a new court order in favor of the target parent. Ideally, it shouldn't be in the courts at all. It would be worth considering having custody default to 50-50 parenting as a starting position. This is sometimes referred to as rebuttable joint custody. It is almost always better to have both parents involved in the child's upbringing. Important too is the ongoing education about parental alienation issues for parents and also for lawyers, judges, counselors, and teachers. Co-parenting is an important life skill. We would now like to share with you 12 commandments for parents that may help avoid parental alienation. These 12 commandments were developed by psychologist Dr. Douglas Darnell. First, Never use children 12 years of age or younger to make visitation or access arrangements. Second, never suggest visitation arrangements you've not previously discussed with the other parent. Always confirm with the other parent any visitation arrangements made with children 13 or older. Third, send in return children who are clean, well-rested and fed. Ideally, don't send or return a backpack or a suitcase full of dirty clothes. Fourth, don't use a telephone answering machine to screen calls from the other parent or limit telephone access between that parent and the children, except after the children's bedtime. Don't talk about divorce disputes with your children or allow them to hear you discussing your disputes with the other parent. Sixth, do not send messages or money with your children. Seventh, don't speak badly about the other parent or that parent's relatives, friends, or loved ones. Eighth, do not ask your children for information about the other parent's household, friends, income, or activities. Ninth, do not believe everything you hear your children say about the other parent, their relatives, or friends. Tenth, don't second guess the other parent about rewards, discipline, or anything else. It's recommended that you write down agreed upon rewards and disciplinary measures. Eleventh, Give a sympathetic ear to your children and affirm as often as necessary that you are not a referee or a mediator between your children and the other parent. Twelfth, when exchanging the children, have them ready to go. Be courteous. Don't honk your horn for your children to come out. Walk to the other parent's door. Be on time. Smile and be pleasant. Remember, these Twelve Commandments always apply unless there's a legal reason not to do so. We hope that everyone watching this video will have learned something about parental alienation. We also hope that more awareness of parental alienation issues will significantly improve the lives of parents and children in divorcing families. We've looked at the components of parental alienation and how it can be recognized in both its more subtle and obvious forms. We've shown its destructive effects and we've looked at what can be done about parental alienation through the court system and through the education of parents, lawyers, judges, 
counselors and teachers. We can't change the past, but with new knowledge and wisdom, we can certainly improve the future. That would be nice. The loss of a parent causes lifelong difficulties for both the children and the parents. We hope that by watching this video it has touched you in some way and that you can take this information and use it to positively affect the children and families during this difficult time. Thank you.